there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. I am here with Sarah. Hello. And we are going to paint a coastal scene today. We're gonna do a little bit of sketching on here, but nothing scary, everybody can do this. This tutorial is suitable for um, beginners on up, so um, everyone is welcome. If you have any questions as we're going along, you can type the word QUESTION in all caps here on YouTube. If you're watching this on my blog, if you just click the word YouTube on the player, it'll pop you over to the watch page and you can uh, chat with friends um, over here. And uh, yeah, if you have a question, just type the word QUESTION in all caps and you can type the question with normal upper and lower case. That just keeps YouTube from like kicking you out of the chat and thinking you're spam. So um, just put the word QUESTION in caps. Um, uh, do you have anything to announce today? Or? I don't. Okay. Um, I do have a couple um, things in the video description. Of course, we have all our supplies listed. And um, I do have a link to um, my drawing class, which is on sale through Wednesday for 30% off. So if you like our little drawing we're going to do today, but you want a little more help, then, uh, then you can get the class at a deal. And um, there's new artwork in my shop at lindsaywyrick.com slash shop. And um, it's first come, first serve. It's all original paintings starting at $45 with USA shipping included and flat rate $10 shipping for the rest of the world. We're gonna start by putting a horizon line in about a third of the way down, and I am just using um, a mechanical pencil. You can use anything you like. You could use a ruler if you want. It wouldn't be a bad idea, honestly, because it's real easy to get these crooked. I'm just gonna try my best to keep that straight, and if it's crooked, then I'll just adjust it when I frame it. And then I am going to start sketching this kind of like um, rocky ledge. About a third, maybe a little bit more than a third of the way up is where I'm starting. You know what? I'm gonna draw mine darker. Uh, don't at home, don't draw it this dark, but I'm gonna make mine darker so that you can see it. And they're gonna be pr fairly dark rocks, so I think that'll be all right. And we're just gonna get this rocky uh, coast here shape. And then I'm going to kind of come in with this foreground gonna bring this swoopy line over and this photo is on my blog if you want to um, to check it out my friend Kelly took this photo she is the author of the rainbow pants and sea glass and the lighthouse um, two books that she wrote and I illustrated if you want to check those out there are links to those as well I'm gonna put the little rocks over here basically I just want to have a few guidelines of where I'm gonna put my paint and over there and then we've got an island kind of poking out do just sort of the hair above the horizon it's not even really an island it's just kind of like um, right along that same coast you can kind of see how there's kind of like a little little bit of a cove there and we'll just bring this back in all right I'm just gonna tip this up to make sure my horizon line is fairly straight it's hard to tell when you're when you're drawing flat. And if you have a real messy uh, line like I do that's really kind of thick, you can go in with your eraser and clean it up, which I'm going to do. Do you have any questions yet? As of we're all, we're, people are just chatting oh, in general. Oh, great, great. Say hello and I'm sure we'll get some as we go along though. Oh, I'm sure. Okay, and the paper I'm using, I decided that I wanted to use some supplies that you can find pretty much at any big box store because, um, you know, for the longest time, that's the only place I buy, bought supplies was whatever my local art shop or craft shop had. So I'm using Canson Montville paper, which is a cellulose paper or wood pulp, and I'm using Cotman watercolors. And everything that we're, the colors that we're going to use today can be found in the $13 pocket box. Um, I'm using this set here just because my pans are bigger and I'm working a large, this is like an 18 by 22 piece of paper. No, I'm sorry, 12 by 16. So I wanted something where I could get a big brush in, but um, the small cotton pocket box will be fine for this. And we are just gonna use any big juicy brush you have to wet the sky. Good excuse to get out those, uh, those real wide ones. Now on a cellulose paper, um, oftentimes it'll dry quicker than on a cotton paper. Um, it doesn't absorb as much and um, sometimes I wet it twice just because um, some parts will sink in a little bit more than others and it will just dry a little unevenly. So by wetting it twice, you can just kind of assure that you're going to have um, 
the wet sky that you need. Also make sure you have a paper towel handy before you start painting because we are going to need that for some cloud work that we're going to do and we have to do that while the paint is wet. Okay so I wet the paper really well and now I'm going to mix my color and I'm going to use a nice big round. I'm going to start with ultramarine blue and before I turn the camera on today I sprayed my palette and that just helps you reactivate your pan paints. It's a great idea anytime you're going to start to paint from dried paint, dried watercolors, but especially if you are using a student grade paint like Cotman. So we've got our ultramarine blue and make sure you mix up enough for the size sky that you're going to be doing. Now I'm going to add some burnt sienna, just a little bit, and that's going to see how it dulls it down. It makes it a little bit less intense. If you don't have burnt sienna, you can use burnt umber. Just go real light with it. You don't need a ton. And I am going to start this at the top of my paper. And I'm actually going to tip it a little bit so it helps it run. Now, if you had looked at your paper and it wasn't shiny anymore, you could wet it again before you begin this, but mine was still plenty shiny. I'm going to add a little bit of phthalo blue. And if you have the Cotman set, they call it intense blue. I always like to add my pigment at the top and then bring it down. And this round brush is giving me some streaks, so I'm actually going to go back to the square brush. And pick up some of that intense blue, a little bit of the uh, first color that we used. Again, starting at the top and working my way down. Now, the wetter your paper, the more shift you're going to have from um, dry to wet so keep that in mind if you want to add more color just add it to the top and work it down and I like these larger pans because I can fit a larger brush in it and you've got some time before it dries on you so just make sure you get the intensity right because you're going to be blotting a bunch off and you got to have some on there to be able to have that contrast don't worry if you go over that island because your island's going to be darker. And then you're going to crunch up your paper towels and your clouds are going to be bigger at the top and they're going to get smaller as you come forward because perspective, anything closer to the top of your paper or the bottom of your paper is closer to the viewer's eyeballs. Now the intense blue is a staining color so it's really important that we um, go in and blot now. We can't let it dry and re-wet it and lift it up because that color will stain. If you think you might be working a little slow, leave out the intense blue. You'll just get a, a less of a, um, uh, you'll get a warmer sky and that's fine. And then as we get lower in the paper, kind of bend your paper towel around, find a clean area, make smaller, smaller puffy clouds. You can start low and work up if you want, if it's easier for you to go little to big. We will be adding some shadow onto these clouds, so go ahead and lift them right up. And don't, don't worry about having too much stark white paper. Watch your fingernails though when you're doing this that you don't get, uh, you don't scratch your paper. Okay, and while that's drying, we can work on this foreground down at the bottom. Let me just scooch that up in frame a little better. Was there a question when I was doing the clouds? No. Nope. Okay. I heard you um, take a breath and I thought, oh, she probably was going to ask a question, but I got to get nope, these clouds just, in. Just a sigh. <laughs> All right, so for the foreground, we're going to grab some yellow ochre. Oh, clean that brush good. I had a little blue left on my brush. These absorbent brushes can... Grab a lot of pigment. So yellow ochre and a little burnt of burnt sienna. And just a hint of the ultramarine blue. And what that's gonna do is just kind of tone it down a little bit so it's a little more gray. And then this, I'm just gonna go right in the dry paper because it's not a really huge area that I have to fill in here. This is just some kind of sandy, um, sandy ground here, kind of looking down over the 
rocky shore. And I'm just going to keep dragging that color up, go grab a little more burnt sienna. Now, if you are a brand new beginner and this is a little bit challenging, you can always um, watch it through live, chat with your friends, enjoy, and then come back and pause it as you need to, because there's no rush. Especially if you find that this, if you're finding a hard time ke uh, keeping up, go with a smaller sized paper. And we'll even bring that right up there. And if it, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sarah Peterson, I got a tube of M. Graham paint Terra Rose. I squirted some onto the palette, a lot of clear liquid, and finally a tiny bit, bit of color in the puddle of clear liquid. Is this normal? Well, that just sometimes happens when paint sits for too long. What I would do is squeeze out a bunch, mix it up. I'd squeeze it out in a pan in your watercolor palette, and then just mix it up with a popsicle stick or a toothpick, and it will be fine. Probably just the paint was sitting a little bit long. Oh, something that might be kind of fun on this piece is to use a little wax, and I've got a little um, clear crayon, or you can use a candle or a piece of wax. We can use that to keep some of our whites in the water. So I'm going to go ahead and just, using the clear crayon, I'm just going to do some kind of ripples far away and up near our rocks here. a good idea to keep a piece of wax or a um, like an Easter egg white crayon handy because you'll find that that's a great way to get some resist. And I'm going to use this hunk of wax, just canning wax, and get some bigger, bigger shapes. Now this is not removable, so um, whatever you put here is going to remain white. So you do want to make sure that you are comfortable with what you end up, you know, what you end up scribbling down. Sometimes if you tip it to the light, you can kind of see where you've gone a little bit better and that can make it a little bit easier to control. There. Uh, I'm gonna dry this so that we can work on the water. So if anybody has any questions um, while I'm running the heat tool here, feel free. Right now we'll really get to see where that wax ended up. Uh, so let's mix up some color. Let's mix it up with a firmer brush though because then we won't introduce so much water and we want our paint to be a little bit darker here. Um, we're gonna start again with our ultramarine blue and I'm gonna mix it into that puddle here that I had for sky color so the colors will agree. But our water is a little bit darker and icier than the sky. Um, it's definitely more gray. Uh, you don't always see that. A lot of times your sky, your water will reflect the sky, but when the waves are choppy and you have an ocean scene, um, you often end up with a much darker sea than sky. And plus our waters in Maine are kind of murky. They're not like sandy, so you don't have that reflection um, of light off the bottom of the ocean. So this is about the color we want, but I know I'm gonna need more, so I'm gonna keep mixing. So I don't have to rinse out my brush. I'm just gonna spray those colors so that way I can just grab that out without wasting what's on my brush. Uh, Amber Klingen, what do you recommend for a good lifting scrubbing brush? Um, well, I got two recommendations. One is a Maxine's mop um, and that can be found on Amazon or on um, any store that sells decorative painting supplies. Uh, if you have an AC more handy, there is a new line of brushes called Menta that's by Royal and Langnickel and they make soft scrub scrubbers that are perfect for watercolor and you want to buy them when in the the uh, section that has the watercolor brushes because Menta also has acrylic and oil lines, but the, the soft scrubbers for watercolor 
are excellent and they're very inexpensive. Regular prices like $5 and they go on sale. So that would be my pick. Now I do want to wet this water. So I'm gonna go in first and just add a layer of water here. I'm gonna to try to go around the uh, island or the little jutting out of rocks there in the cove. Bev Roberts, when you use a resist like that, do you at any time remove it? Not this, this is a permanent mask, a permanent resist because it's wax and I mean, you could iron it off your paper, but I think you would risk damaging um, some of the other elements. So I would just leave it on. Uh, May Kristen Brox, will the Caran d'Ache full blender stick work when I don't have a clear crayon? It might, but it's pretty hard. I think you'd end up denting your paper. Um, if you have a, like an old candle, like a paper candle that you can break or some candy wax or, I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy, just any, any piece of wax, like wax seal from something, just, just a white or clear wax will be, is your best, best option. You can get candy wax at the grocery store for like a buck and you'll have a lifetime supply if you're just using it for watercolor. Okay, so that's going to give us a little time to work. Uh, I'm going to use that same brush and I'm going to go, I'm going to use a chisel edge of the brush and I'm going to put my paint in using horizontal strokes. It, not that it matters too much, but um, it's when I use a chisel edge, I have an easier time getting a, a straight line because I can kind of wiggle my way up to the uh, horizon that I sketched in there. I find it a lot easier to control than a round brush for this situation. And then any brush strokes that are that do remain will have that same um, direction as the water. Now, a um, predicament that you can have working with um, cellulose paper like this is that it's going to want to buckle a lot more than the cotton counterparts. So I, when you're the, the time when it really is a problem is when you're trying to do your horizon line and your paper is wavy and you're trying to get a straight line. So. Um, you might have to go back in with uh, with this color and even things up later if you can't get that straight line. But if your pencil line was true and you're sticking to your pencil line, you should it, it'll dry flat. So taking the time to get a good a good sketch on there is is worth it. And you can see how some of these lines, since I'm putting it in horizontally with the um, kind of with the direction the water would be flowing, some of those brush strokes are remaining, and it gives us that watery look and like that little bloom of water there looks like a faraway wave so it's just really easy to get that look without much effort. Uh, Ian Jackson, what do you think is the key to this painting, the sense of depth and depth and distance? Um, I think having the foreground rocks big and the clouds big up to the two edges of your canvas, uh, the top and the bottom of your canvas, that's what's going to give it depth and perspective. because the water is pretty close to the same tone all throughout. The sky's a little bit darker at the top, but then you have all those clouds, so that's not really helping you with the perspective. It's mostly the, uh, the scale of the rocks and the clouds, I think. And leave plenty of sparkle down here um, near the rocks because you would have the water churning a little bit, so you don't want to have too much blue there like in this little low area. And if you see something that just looks like, hey, that looks like water splashing, leave it, you know, even if it's not exactly how mine is, if it's working, if it's looking good on your paper, leave it. Now, speaking of leaving it, this leftover paint, I'm gonna leave that. I'm not gonna mix into that. I might take a little for something, but that's gonna be really handy if I need to go in and do anything like glaze over some shadows or darken bits of the water. So I'm gonna leave that because I know it's that exact same color and that way I won't have to try to mix and match it later. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to work on the shadows on the clouds. So since we're painting clouds, we want to choose a brush that is kind of cloud shaped. And um, I just, this is one of those Menta brushes that I was telling you about. Um, this is a mop shape brush and it's supposed to uh, mimic a goat hair mop. Um, if you have a goat hair mop, you can use that. Um, so basically you want like a filbert. This one is completely synthetic and it's 
pretty absorbent. It won't be as absorbent as a goat hair mop um, because these are plastic bristles and the goat hair is like a really soft, fluffy animal hair. Uh, but it's going to help us get that shape. You can also use a round, but if you have a filbert, this is a filbert shape here, how it has that more of a, it's like a flat. That's a big difference between a round and a filbert. Your ferrule has been flattened where the, where the bristles come together. That's what makes it a filbert. Those filberts or mops are going to give you your best um, cloud shape. Just look for that squashed fill, the squashed ferrule. And I am going to take some ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna. And what I'm going for is a slightly cool gray. And mix up a little bit. You're not going to need too much. You're not going to need as much as you did for the sky or the water because this is just an accent. A little bit cooler there. And balance your grays balance your grays and then make them a little cooler and I don't want to put the uh, the phthalo blue into this mix because that's a staining color and if I do end up with an issue and I need to remove it I don't want that phthalo to be left behind um, and I'm gonna turn around my paper and I'm gonna work from the um, I'm gonna work upside down and I'm also holding it up with my hand, so I'm at an angle. If you can't hold it up and, and uh, paint at the same time, you can put like a roll of tape or something behind it. And I'm gonna start um, by kind of giving myself some shape at the bottom of these clouds. And then something that I like to do, it's a little scary, but I will spray and let it kind of float. And it just gives you a really nice effortless cloud and then you can just kind of blot where the spray wants to kind of collect and puddle so you don't end up with back runs but it gives you a really nice um, natural looking shadow I'm gonna do that over here and I can even work into some of the wetter areas that we just we just uh, wet we don't want like a menacing storm clouds we just want those kind of um, strong shadows spray bottle there this spray bottle any small spray bottle recycled hairspray bottle will work this is a just a soho spritzer bottle from jerry's artorama i think it came in my um image transfer kit it doesn't have to be fancy the dollar store sells them Make sure to blot any puddles though, because you don't want those back runs. When we flip it around, you don't want to have those drips sending your clouds into the ocean. And you can do the wiggle here, just kind of rock your brush back and forth to get little shadows on some of these. And your main shadows though are going to be on your bigger clouds. Just kind of pat, rock and spray. Don't be afraid of the spray. I'm going to mix up a little bit more of that because I'm running out. I'm going to refill my pan. So when these, um, when your watercolors are empty and you bought like a, say you bought the Cotman set because you're starting out and you're on a budget, um, and I recommended them because I think they're a great way to get started. As you run out, you may decide that, okay, I really use ultramarine blue a lot. I'd like to try Mgram or I'd like to try Core. I'd like to try one of these other brands that um, I was a little too afraid to try before because they were kind of expensive. You can buy a tube of that and just refill your pan. Just squeeze it right into your pan and let it dry. Um, any artist quality paint is going to dry fine in your pans. So you could even go with the Winsor & Newton. Even though they say you should buy the pans and not buy their tubes and squeeze them into pans, I've never had any problem with that. No artist I know of has ever had a problem doing that. Um, so I would say any, pretty much any brand that you choose is going to be fine to do that. And that way, if you're just um, collecting colors one at a time as you use them up, you know their colors you're going to use. And you're not going to be spending a ton of money at once. You know, you could spend, you know, six or seven dollars a tube, you know, once a month until, you know, you've, as you've used up and replaced your colors. So you, you know, you can, you can upgrade to artists really inexpensively, but don't feel like you have to start off with the most expensive paints. And those are spritz.
this is a technique that works so good on the the, the cotton i'm uh, not the cotton the uh it'll work on the cotton paper but it works really well on the cellulose paper now looking at it front ways again you may say oh i wish that was a little bit darker there everything's still wet so you can go in and you can add some of that darker color you can just kind of tip it away from you as you do You can build some depth depth in those clouds and it still looks nice and bright out it doesn't look like it's gonna thunderstorm yeah it's main <laughs> seriously so it thunderstorm anytime oh man this week <laughs> went from like 40 degrees to 88 in the course of two days uh gail ac is there a difference in quality on the topic of tubes versus pans no if you're buying artists and art like if you're buying say Sennelier, a tube of the same color versus a pan of the same color, you're going to get the exact same quality. I think, I think, I think in Europe, pans are more popular, maybe. I like, I like to start off with pans. Like if I'm, if I'm tr trying out a new brand and I want to get a set, I generally will buy a pan set and then the colors that I use up, I'll replace in tubes if I really like that brand. And if I'm not, if I'm, you know, if the brand is just, you know, nothing spectacular nothing that different than what i already have then i'll just refill it with whatever i happen to have on hand but the qual quality wise in artist grade will be the same now in student grade you know you may prefer to work right from the tube and you might prefer to buy cotton tubes and work right from the tube um so that you get more vivid colors but quality wise there really there really isn't a difference it's more it's just personal preference wise Okay, now I might go in and even deepen some of that sky in the future, but for right now, I think I'm going to leave that as it is, let it dry, and see how it looks once everything has shifted, um, shifted to the dry color. Now I think, you know, I'm going to dry this because I'm not sure that's quite dry enough, so um, another great time to take some questions if anybody has any. Now, if you were sitting outside at the beach painting this, it would be dry practically as soon as you got your paint on the paper. So, um, so if you've never painted on location before, give it a try. It's so much fun, especially if you hate how long it takes your paints to dry sometimes. Now I'm just putting in some color here. Um, I basically want to get a, um, a lighter wash down. I've got some of that kind of yellow ochre mix that we used here. And now I'm going to throw in just a little burnt sienna to that. I'm still pretty much putting a, a wash of the highlight colors. And as I work down, I will get some darker colors in because we are going to be working with our credit card scraper and we can kind of squeegee our paint around a bit. So for my darker color, I'm going to take the burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. You can use burnt umber if um, you're having a hard time getting a dark enough color with your burnt sienna. The Burnt Sienna from Windsor & Newton um, is, I think, a little weak and a little on the red side. I think they might use PR101 rather than the... Um, I'm going to switch to a flat because rocks are kind of hard and angular, so I'll get a better result with that. Um, so if you have if you have a hard time getting it getting it dark enough, go ahead and use, use your Burnt Umber. In fact, I'll grab some Burnt Umber right there. See how even how red this Burnt Umber is? It looks almost like a Burnt Sienna from other brands. Uh, Cheryl Collier, when painting in the desert, it dries in a flash. Any tips for dealing with that? Add a little bit of glycerin to your rinse water and that will help it um, stay a little bit wetter for you. sure that I'm keeping um, a little bit of a different difference in value between this foreground and the rocks back here try to keep your paint wet as you're going try to keep this whole area wet because we are going to be scraping into it and we need we need some water there in order to be able to scrape in 
So it's okay if everything blends because we're going to scrape and that's how we're going to get our rocky texture. If you have to paint it over, that's fine. Okay, so just make sure everything's wet and then grab your credit card scraper. Um, and what I recommend for a credit card scraper, take an old gift card, um, cut it up, make sure you have different widths. So you want some wider ends, some skinnier ends, some you know scrapier, pointier ends. That's gonna help you get a nice variety of shapes. So I'm gonna start just kind of scraping my paint. So I'm gonna like be squeegeeing it around. Don't really worry about rock so much right now. Worry more about just scraping away abs abstract shapes. You know, any of these gouges that you make are going to remain, but don't fret about that because it will turn out looking like rocks when you're done. Uh, Bev Roberts, were you ever able to find out the pigment info for the student grade of Senlier watercolor paints? Um. Gosh, I don't know. I did a review on them. Um, I can't remember if they put it on the box or not. or on Because I had the pan set and there was no wrappers or anything. Um, off the top of my head, honestly, I don't remember. If I had that information, it would be in that the review of that of that set. I would reckon they are the same pigments as their artist counterpart, just maybe with a little bit more extender. But honestly, side by side, they're very similar. So... There might be a little bit more extender to them, or they might be the exact same thing, just, you know, introducing people to that line of paint. I'm going to use some smaller scrapes over here, but it's starting to dry, so I'm not going to be able to do too much. Plus, um, it's starting to peel the paper a little bit, uh, but that's fine because we want that rocky texture. I'm not going to worry about that, um, but I'm going to let that dry and move over here to this area. And I'm going to go in with... I'm going to take a little burnt sienna and add it to that color we had just made with the burnt umber and ultramarine blue because I want this to be a little bit, a little bit um, warmer and a little bit lighter. And I'm going over some light areas that we already painted. So I'm just kind of cho very choppily putting in some shadows. And this time we're going to use our scrapers to accent. So there we actually built up all those really craggy rocks with the scrapers. And here we're going to just be doing some accenting. So you can do cracks in the rocks by using, kind of slicing it like a knife. You can do a little scraping to make highlights. Just a little bit of texture here and there. Anything that looks too bold, you can soften with a little bit of water and spread the pigment around. Now another thing you could do is you could actually just stick little squares of tape, just whip masking tape and stick tape all over these rocky areas, paint your sky and water, um, and then rip off the tape and then you would have this kind of chunky abstract rock area that would be easy to, uh, to turn into rocks because that way you're not thinking about painting a rock, you're just the rocks just happen behind the tape. So now I'm, what I'm going to do is take burnt umber and ultramarine blue in fairly equal parts to make almost a black. It can be cool. And I am going to just kind of tap it using chisel edge. Chisel edge and also just kind of the corner of my brush to make this outcropping of rocks. I'm gonna pick a little burnt sienna. Some warmer sun bleached rocks in there too. back to the dark and get the, those rocks in the bottom nice and dark. So they'll be darker where they're wet. And then if you want to do any scraping, you're just basically squeezing some of the paint out of the way. 
giving it some texture. Everyone, a couple people heard the water heater come on. They're like, how cold is it? 62. <laughs> yeah, and the basement takes a while to warm up. Yeah. Yeah, that's a furnace. Yeah, I find it very, very annoying. That's like, I'll be like filming a video. I'm like, oh, sorry guys, water heater. Of course, if I didn't say anything, I probably, probably know, like half people wouldn't even notice, but now I'm going in with this flat brush. It's not completely dry, but um, but I think you're, you're fine to work in there. Uh, if you find that your paint is just like bleeding on you or feathering, then you can wait for it to dry or dry it with a heat tool. Uh, again, we want another concentrated, um, color with your blue, with your um, ultramarine blue and, bur and uh, burnt umber. There we go. Those are the colors. And we're just going to kind of go in and put some shadows on some of these rocks, especially rocks in the water. You can even throw in some extras in the water if you want to. Give your world as many rocks as you like. Have you read that book by John Hodgman, The True Stories from Painful Beaches, Vacation Land? No, I have not. Oh, it's so funny. It's about uh, vacationing in Maine. <laughs> He's from away, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> clearly. I heard our oceans are actually getting colder up here because the Gulf Stream is weakening. Because it's not such a, a, a big, big contrast between the waters in the, near the equator and the waters near the Arctic. So... Oh that difference was making the the um the waters kind of circulate a little bit more i'm like come on <laughs> we're like the only place in the world that's getting colder because of global warming that's true we are aren't we even though yes. it's getting warmer it's crazy warming this up over here i love the rocks because you can just kind of forget that you're painting rocks and just get lost in the abstraction of it there's a uh, wonderful artist. He painted, I think in like 1920s and 1930s, named, I believe it's um, John Marin. And he did all these like uh, coastal, abstract coastal seascapes and, and like boatyards and things like that. And it was just so, it was so neat. And I could totally see where he was getting his inspiration from. But I mean, you wouldn't look at that and say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a um, seascape. But then when you see the title of it, you could, you could totally get that that's what he was what he was painting oh I like that cluster of rocks and that's not quite dry enough yet I think I'm gonna hit that with the dryer real quick oh, actually no we can let that we can let that do its thing let's take some of that dark blue that we had left over and glaze on our water since we've dried that a couple times we should be fine there might be a few damp spots but I don't think it's going to cause us any grief. Um, and with the shadows in the water, you're going to end up with places. It's very patchy with where the lights and darks go. And I think that's just because of the way the sea ripples and waves. So I'm just going to go in and throw in some darker areas. I want to make sure I preserve some lights. The lights, the waxy lights are going to be preserved on their own. I don't have to worry. But there are some like really kind of happy accidents that happened like right there and right there that I want to, I want them to re to remain. So I'm just going to kind of skip around. Remember chisel edge. This is a three quarter inch flat and I'm just chisel edge. It's easier to do this with a brush that's bigger than a brush that's smaller. Around some of these white caps, you can go in with that color. You don't want to fuss with anything too much. You just want to kind of deepen those colors here and there. It's nice to put it next to the white caps because you get that contrast. And going horizontal chisel edge strokes, you're going to get that um, choppiness to the water. Just be careful around any area that you just painted that's wet. Uh, so it doesn't bleed. Uh, Catherine Reeves, I always mess up my shadows. Where do I put them? Um, is she talking about rocks or water? She just says shadows. Shadows. So. Well, um, a good rule of thumb is to establish a light source. Um, so if you're going from reference photo and you can't really tell, maybe make like a little arrow 
or stick a post-it note on one side of your picture so that would could represent the sun or light so your shadows would always be on the opposite sides of things that doesn't always work just because you may have an area where you have several lighting sources or you're um you know outside and there's you know the one direct light source the sun but then you might have other you know um you have shapes that will that will cast the light unusually um but but finding a, a central light source is probably the best way to to kind of get around that I'm gonna grab some of my darker color here and work on some of these rocks they're still a little damp but I think I can they're not bad they're just a little cool to the touch they're not like shiny wet or anything I'm just tapping in some cracks in the rocks I'm kind of looking at what I have scraped and kind of turning those scrapes into shadows and fissures use a reference as a guide but look at what you've scraped and what your rocks look like and go for what's going to make the picture look more appealing just kind of slapping that flat brush down here and there will give you rocky um, rocky shapes and rocky textures what you don't want to do is make all your rocks line up like little soldiers you want kind of like uneven sized chunks um, nothing should match nothing should be symmetrical All right, so now for this foreground area, I am again going to take some of that mixed gray color, kind of a sandy gray, and I want to kind of like suggest that there's like maybe a little path way here, like getting some shadows in here, like a lot of people probably stand out here and take a photograph. This is actually right out in front of um, the Bushes place in kind of Bankport. Kelly said, like, if you just turned, like, you turned halfway, I think she said to the left, you would see George and Barbara Bush's house. And there were a lot of people still there mourning, like, on the beach. Mm. So she was trying not to, not to, uh, bother anyone when she was there taking this picture. And I think I want to lighten that little rock area up. This is a Maxine's mop, and this is a Mentis scrubber. I was really actually using it. Um, so this is the quarter inch Maxine's mop, which I've had a, lot, a hard time finding. And I was able to find this number six Menta scrubber by Roland Langnickel, and it is almost a perfect rep like replacement for that. Um, I don't know if they stopped making the quarter inch because people weren't buying it, but I've had a really hard time finding it. Um, places to, rec to refer people to. And the Menta Scrubbers, I think there's even bigger sizes. I just got these two because I thought they would be the most useful for me. Um, and I, well, I also wanted to make sure the smaller one was going to work like the Maxine's Mop before I suggested it to people. But it's really fantastic. Now what I'm doing here is I am just scrubbing out the pigment in this rock because this is a foreground rock and I want it to be brighter. It's also a little more round and worn down. So I just wanted to have a different, a little bit different of a color too. And you just want to blot. It's very important on um, wood pulp paper that you don't rub. Now on a cotton paper, you can get by with like, maybe you're doing your water and you just want to wipe out some white caps like that. You can get by with that on cotton paper. It works beautifully. However, on your wood pulp paper, it is going to make pills and it's going to give you marring of the surface. So when you paint over or you glaze over, you're going to have darker spots because you have like basically wiped away the sizing in your paper. And, um, and it's going to be difficult to work with after that. I really like my, my shadows there. I think I'm going to go in and add a little bit more of that gray color. Did you have a question, Sarah? Uh, well, we had someone ask if, uh, we, if, uh, they could use the, um, reference photo. You can paint. Yeah. You can paint from this. Kelly gave me permission to teach it. So you guys can, can paint from this. Absolutely. It's right on my blog thefrugalcrafter.wordpress.com. Okay, so we've got some little like grasses growing here in the foreground. I gotta make sure this is dry before I do that or they're gonna feather. But be so before uh, I worry about that, there's actually some texturing that I can do. And I'm gonna need a toothbrush for that and a piece of scrap paper. So I'm gonna wander over here, but you guys can't tell because the camera's not That's on me. That's right. And the microphone's kinda in between both of us. So there we go, found a toothbrush. Soothing rustle of brushes. <laughs> 
I'm going to grab a piece of scrap paper here. All right, so I'm going to tear this paper. And by tearing the paper, it gives me a little bit of a rough edge. I'll try to tear it with a little bit of a curve to it. And I'm basically making a, a mask here so that I can spatter and not get it anywhere I don't want it. And actually, it's not a bad idea for me to put something on the top. I'm just going to throw my... I'll just open up this pad of paper and throw it up there because that way it will protect everything. And I'm going to spatter on some burnt umber. I'm just going to I just have the toothbrush. If you look over to the... Um, uh, to the right of your screen you can see I'm just like right on the pan with that toothbrush and then I'm just going to kind of work it off on the palette there and it looks really dark but once it comes out it's not going to be that crazy dark and I'm just going to flick now the wetter your brush the more big your spatters are going to be so if you want it a little bit drier if you want it a little bit smaller just blot your brush on your paper towel I didn't think I was going to spray today I just repainted my my table white <laughs> yeah there's more color on it it's just one color i know i was kind of enjoying that <laughs> nice and bright in here now i want some darker speckles so i'm going to add a little ultramarine blue to my puddle here and this will give us that kind of sandy texture as well Okay, so let's take a look at that and see how it looks. Because it's watercolor, we can soften it if we need to. I'm not crazy about this area, but I think when it dries, it's going to be a lot lighter and it's not going to bother me so much. And if it does bother me, there's going to be some little grasses over there, so <laughs> it will be fine. That's where the birds are nesting, is over in the grass. Good, nice osprey nest there. And now I am just kind of uh, going over some of my shadows in the path and just kind of spreading out some of those speckles. And I'm going to grab a little bit of um, that mix and add a little shadow into this rock here. Just right up next to it. All right. Now I'm going to look at the sky again and see if that needs, uh, needs anything else now that it's pretty well. Oh gosh, that's not even dry yet. It's still pretty damp down here, you know yeah, that? Yeah, it is. Well, we've only had what... Two warm days. Yeah, really. It's looking good. This like it looks like the next four days after today is going to be like sunny and high sixties. So I'm ready. I'm ready to thaw out. Wednesday was great. I finally finished thawing out. <laughs> oh yeah, it was Wednesday the 88 degree day. Or was that Tuesday? That was Wednesday because Michaela had a day. Had, it was her day off, so she, we got our chores done, and then she came up and we just sat outside. Oh, nice. for the afternoon. Had a few adult beverages because we didn't have anywhere to go, anything yeah. to do, and just soaked up the heat it was lovely jason and i went over to the audubon uh trails and we hiked and then we we brought the camera and the painting stuff and we did some plein air painting and well i did some plein air painting and he did some filming of the plein air painting so that should be coming up soon hopefully i haven't seen any of that footage yet it might be uh too windy or i don't know but it was fun <laughs> had a good time yeah Got to be outside. Oh, it was so nice. It was really nice. That's the same day I spray painted this table, actually. Yeah. The one day I can actually spray paint because it's been too cold. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go back in the sky. This time I think I'm going to take some of this color that I used in the sea since I already did my glazing on that. And I really think I can probably go with this um, on its own, but I'm going to pick my darkest colors. Like right in here, this area is the darkest. So this is my um, my paint is about as thin as um, I would say like a really watery like skim milk. It's really thin. Pretty much like water, actually. This brush holds so much; it's pretty much absorbed everything that was in that puddle. And because the paper's not wet, even though this is the paint is pretty wet, the paper's not wet underneath, and I'm not spraying it, so I'm getting a pretty accurate look of how dark this is going to be. And I'm going kind of into my darker areas anyway, so I probably won't even need to feather that out. I 
And so these brush strokes will remain. I'm going to mix up. Well, this is a pretty, a little hard edged on the top there. So I'm just going to brush clear water over that and soften that a little bit. This is a real soft brush, so it's not going to damage the paper. I just want to soften up those edges. And that's what mop brushes were always generally used for, would be softening. Um, I like them for applying like clouds and things like that, where you want that kind of soft, squishy, puffy line. Remember, this is just the darkest areas we're going over. I got a little bit too much burnt umber in there. You can see it's got kind of like a yellow tint to it. So I'm gonna blot that up right now before it holds up to the paper. And I'm gonna add a little more blue into my mix. Make sure that's really mixed in good before I apply it to my paper again. Your, your dab should get smaller as you're coming down towards the horizon line because your clouds are smaller. I had a weird bloom over here, so I'm just tapping on a few shadowy clouds to kind of uh, hide that fact. You just put a little bird in there. Bob that would be a pretty, pretty big bird, like a seagull <laughs> aiming right for you. I think it would be a little, little uh, <laughs> stressful, a little scary. <laughs> a rabid bird, not a happy bird. <laughs> The birds are mad about the weather, too. Mm. The cloud painting can get a little addictive, so I'm going to stop before I turn it into a dark and stormy night here. And I'm going to dry the foreground because it is not... Dry. Actually, I can work on these rocks while I'm waiting for the foreground to dry. I'm going to go back to my flat, mix up some nice dark here, burnt umber. Whoops. I don't want to get into that color. I think that's violet. Okay, so I'm mixing up some nice dark. You can see it's almost black or a Payne's gray, really. It's ultramarine blue plus um, plus burnt um, burnt umber. Now, some people like to use Payne's gray for the sky, and that's fine. Just make sure that you use that Payne's gray in other places. Payne's gray is almost like um, a deep indigo. Uh, it's it's pretty much like what you get when you mix your burnt umber with the, or your burnt sienna with your um, ultramarine. It does have some other colors in it. Sometimes it can even contain a violet, depending on what brand you're using. Um, and that's totally fine. It's, it's a beautiful granulating color. Sometimes it has some black in it that granulates. Um, but if you're going to use it, just make sure you use it other places so it doesn't look like you have this out of place, you know, dark that doesn't match anything. So there's no bad colors. You just got to make sure that you harmonize them. And this can also, when you're putting your, your shadows on these rocks, it's giving you some nice contrast to this light, bright foreground that we really want to use to help us get some nice perspective. You know, in the reference photo, there is like a little like dried up bush over here, but I don't really like that. So I'm not putting it in mine. If you want to put it in yours, you can do that. But I'm just going to continue my rocks on over here. I'm using a combination of like taps of the chisel edge to get me the kind of those big cracks. I'm also doing some, just kind of some broad strokes with my brush. And I'm also just kind of tapping in the corner here and there to give little dents and divots. I want this rock here to be a little bit cooler, so I'm just going to take some of this uh, cloud color that we had made and just glaze over that. And that's going to cool the temperature down and give it more of a gray color, a little cooler. Which usually cool colors go back, but because we have so many warm colors in those rocks, it's just going to give us a little contrast. 
And I can use a little bit of that over here on these rocks too. They're a little closer to the viewer and they might be that same type of rock material. Okay, I'm gonna dry this and then we're gonna put our finishing touches on. Any questions coming through? Not so far. We're all talking about uh, ants and bugs and weather and pets. Oh boy. <laughs> that is an eclectic uh, conversation mix. It is. All right, that's dry enough. So I want to show you a couple different liner options. This is a liner that I use most of the time. This is a number two liner by Creative Mark Mimic. It's long, um, it's a round brush that has long bristles that carries a lot of water. And since the bristles, there aren't a lot of bristles, you can get a really fine line. This is a number six liner. You can tell it's a liner by the length of the bristles. And this is a Royal and Lane Nickel Minta. So this would be for if I wanted to make like tree branches, this would be like for grasses. Now this brush could do either. This is a quarter inch Princeton Neptune dagger. Um, you've got the skinny uh, ending of the bristles there that can give you a really fine line. And then you've got the whole belly of the brush, which you can actually bend your bristles more. So if I'm trying to get a, a fine line, I'm just using the tip of that of the bristles. But if I want to get a wide line, I'm going to press it and use the uh, fatter part of the brush. So you get a little bit more um, versatility with this. This brush can be a little unwieldy because of um, uh, because you have those wide bristles and they taper to a tiny bristle. Uh, but if you develop your skill with it, it can be really, uh, really useful brush to have. So I'm going to start off with some sap green. And since I'm getting this color uh, for the first time today, I'm going to mix it in with some of the blue that I've been using. And I'm also going to add some yellow ochre to it because that's a yellow I've been using. And that's going to keep me from having um, a really out of place color. That's going to harmonize that and actually we could try let's try mixing that intense blue with yellow ochre and see if that's a if that color is just as good because if we don't need to use sap green that would be um that would be even better so let's try yellow ochre and the intense blue which is also phthalo blue but Windsor Newton calls it intense blue oh look at that actually I think that'll be fine we don't need to use sap green Okay, and so what we're going to do now is we're just going to throw in some grasses starting on the foreground. I'm going to keep this area in here ungrassed because that's where people, it's kind of like a little walking path area. Uh, Creative Planet Janet, do you ever mix some fine sand in your paint to mimic granulation? Not with watercolor. There is granulation medium. Um, and texture medium, which is kind of like that. It's kind of like a gritty, uh, the, the texture medium is a gritty medium that you can add to your paints. Um, I don't think that watercolor itself has enough binder in it to stick sand to your paper. Like, I think it would come off. I think you would need to mix it with like uh, some sort of glue or maybe gum Arabic on its own. So I would use a texture medium for that. I'm not sure I'm really loving that color. I'm actually going to go in with a sap green mix because it's looking a little too, I don't know. I don't really like the way it looks. I'm going to put some longer grasses here at the front. You mix fine sand in with your acrylics and because that has enough binder in it to hold it. And I've done that before. I'm going to take some yellow ochre on its own. Some dried grasses in there. You go over these first little grasses that I made in that color. Once I had it on the paper, I wasn't really loving it. Just gonna 
kind of just drag up your brushes, brushes uh, your bristles, drag them right up from the bottom of your paper. If you have your paper taped down, start on the tape and work them up from there. Now if I feel like everything's just too samey, then I will grab another brush and do some more. That just keeps you from being too repetitive. I'm gonna grab some burnt sienna with my liner brush and put some grasses in with that color. Cause nothing's really green yet in Maine. Everything's still pretty. We're getting some green in our yard we, that's, though. Yeah, we are, we are getting some, but there's still an awful lot of brown and. Yes, yes. And uh, the maple trees are budding. Yes, so that's red really. That's yes. Kind of red. Yeah, it almost looked like fall down at the Audubon um, Society. It was cause you're seeing all the budding maples and they're so red over the pond. usually have lilacs at my parents' house by Father's Day. I don't know if we will this year. I, it's... Spring's like a month behind. Yes, I don't think yeah. there... Because our lilac bush is just starting to, like, get a little growth on it. Yeah. It seems like we've had them... Like, the end of May we'll have lilacs. Like, yeah. at my parents' house. Or... Central, southern Maine. Western, I guess. Central and western. Oh, we had someone request to say Kenny Bunkport out loud because they wanted to know what it sounded like. Kenny Bunkport? Kenny Bunkport. <laughs> or if you're from down east, it's Kenny Bunkport. <laughs> we say Kenny, Kenny Bunkport. I never really thought about how I say Kenny Bunkport. But it's not Bangor. It's Bangor. For goodness sakes. There's no E in Bangor. It's an O. <laughs> I'm using a fan brush. This is actually like a hog fan brush that you might use for oil painting. I'm using this to throw in a few like groups because everything just looks so singular to me. Get some old uh, brown here. It'll look like dried up grasses left over from last year. We're gonna get some of that in there. If you use too much fan brush, it um, it can look really fake. But if you just get if you use it here and there and then blend it in with some single grasses it can really cut your work down. And then we'll dry it before we um, finish up today because it, when you have the wet grasses, it does look a little, it doesn't, they look darker than they're gonna end up being. So it'll give you a better, better look at what it's really gonna end up looking like. Maybe a few, mix up a little bit more of that watercolor and add a little bit some accented lines in the water. I think that would be pretty too. And I'm going to do it with my dagger brush just because I think it's going to help me keep a really nice um, swaying loose line. Especially in the foreground you can have more um, expressive lines. Crystal Mack, could you please explain how to establish depth in any painting? Um, well, either by value or by perspective, like size-wise. So things closer to you will be bigger. So if you draw things closer to you larger, like things at the front of the picture, like towards the bottom, like these big chunky rocks versus those smaller chunky rocks, and these big puffy clouds up here versus these smaller clouds near the horizon, that will help you build um, depth and scale and also like warmer colors come forward so having this warm sandy area here is going to help it come forward and having these cool waters will help push them back um so so color temperature cool recedes warm comes forward and you know just making sure that your scale in whatever you're drawing or painting is um is correct you have some some things large in the foreground that can help give you that scale Right, I just want to look and see if there's any darker crevices needed in these rocks. I'm just going to define a few of these uh, foreground ones. Um, still, I'm going to use that dagger because it just keeps me from getting too bogged down.
I'm going to do the same over here. You can use the side of the dagger and, and drag down shadows. And I think I'm going to do a little spattering down here, um, but I'm going to do the spattering with blue and it can break up some of these areas here. Um, and make sure my toothbrush is clean. So I want some all spatter, so I'm loading up my toothbrush, getting about the right color that I want. And then I'm going to blot it before I spatter it so I don't end up with... Um, with too much. And it's, you know, the spray would be white or it would be catching the water, make it look white, but we're giving the essence of that kind of churning sea. So that's why it's fine if we want to keep it that color. Uh, Susan VK, do you find that the wax ever melts later? I am in the South. Uh, I never had, it's never, it's really thin, and even if it does melt, because I was just using the heat gun on it, it's just going to make it absorb into the paper. It's not going to affect anything. If you're going to, if you if you love your painting and you frame it, you're going to have it in a frame with a mat between the glass and the painting, so it's not going to melt and stick to the glass or anything. So I would not let that trouble you. All right, uh, let's see, anything else I want to add? What do you think, Sarah? I think, you could fuss, I think you could fuss with it for a lot more and then overdo it. I think you're right. I'm just gonna dry this, uh, these areas I just put in so we can see it accurately. So if you have any questions, then uh, fire away. We're all caught up. Now we're all talking about cats. Cats, oh. How we pronounce, pronounce different pl places around me. Around ah. If you did want a little more detail in the grass, you can go in with colored pencils later. You can also highlight with pastels. Anything you want to do, um, if you're not happy with your painting when you're done, is absolutely fine. The point um, is that you're happy with it and that you've learned something that you've enjoyed yourself. I think that's dry enough to see how it really looks. And people did want to see the original image too. Do you have that available to show? It's on my computer. Okay. I don't think I can pull it over that's here. Okay. They can go it's on, on my blog. blog. Yep, it's on my blog. And it was on the thumbnail. I'll be putting I'll be changing the thumbnail to this painting, um, but it's the current thumbnail. Uh, so that's it for today. Uh, all of the supplies I used are linked up in the video description. All the colors we used are found in the, the $13 pocket box, Cotman pocket box, um, which is, a, I think, a wonderful beginner set if you're, you know, brand new to watercoloring um, or a nice travel set. Um, the paper is Canton Montville, very affordable, so you don't have to spend a lot of money to do a nice painting. Any questions before we sign off? We're all caught up. All right. I want to thank everyone for hanging out today. And um, everything's linked in the video description. The, the uh, coupon for my drawing class that's good till Wednesday. Um, my new artwork in the shop. And all of the information for this painting. So thanks so much for watching. And until next time, happy crafting.